Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'll be giving a workshop on Substrate, which is a framework on, uh, for building custom blockchains. So first I'll just introduce myself. So my history in the space starts in 2015. Uh, that's when I started to uh, make Bitcoin transactions. Um, but it wasn't until a couple of years later when Ethereum uh, came out that I started to uh, engage as a developer, as a smart contract engineer. So I've been involved with, in some early stage startups in the space. Um, now I'm, I work at Web3 Foundation where I uh, work on documentation and as a runtime engineer. So one of the major projects that my team uh, the technical education team has done is the Polkadot Wiki. And we're pretty proud of this because we think it's essentially the best documentation of any blockchain project. Um, so feel free to ask any questions that might come up during the next two presentations and I'll do my best to answer them. So uh, if you're Thinking about following along for the workshop, that's the next session, uh, please run this command now. Uh, so this will download the um, substrate dependencies. So you, uh, yeah, you can run this command in your command line. This will take about 20 minutes to fully install. Uh, that's, why you, that's why I want you to start by doing it and then um, hopefully we'll have it ready by the next session. Okay, so um, let's start out by uh, de describing what Substrate is. So Substrate is an open source, modular and extensible framework for building blockchains. So it's similar to a library that you might use, um, but it's a bit more than that because it actually lays out the structure and uh, it gives you the tools to build blockchains. So if you come from like a web development world, you can think of it as something similar to React, uh, where it gives you a kind of a new, a new domain language that you can use to write a blockchain. So what Substrate does is it provides the core components of a blockchain. So this is things like the database layer, um, the networking, so the, the gossip protocol, uh, the cons consensus engine. <clears throat> so for um, the default for this is proof of stake. But there's also substrate chains that support proof of work. And then uh, you have an implementation of the transaction queue and a library of runtime modules. Um, so all of these are completely open source. They can be customized, extended. Uh, you can write new ones to do whatever kind of logic that you can imagine. So a substrate node kind of has a few major pieces. Um, kind of the very internal of the node is the runtime. So this is the application logic that, that makes your chain special. So if your chain is a smart contract chain, uh, the runtime has implemented smart contracts. If your chain is a, uh, let's say a, a ledger, like, um, like a Bitcoin chain that just does transactions, then the runtime handles that logic. But outside of the runtime, there's kind of a whole slew of uh, software that needs to be written for a blockchain. And sub for Substrate, this comes right out of the box. So this, this is stuff like the consensus, the block storage, the transaction pool. Um, and then your node needs some way to communicate to the rest of the network and to accept commands. So kind of the external ports of the node are the libp2p library, which handles the networking, and the JSON RPC, which handles um, accepting and returning data uh, from an external 
commands. So the runtime is um, the runtime is built with and compiled into Wasm, whereas the rest of the code is written in Rust, and it compiles to native code, so na native machine code. So the substrate runtime is the block execution logic. So we like to think of blockchains as uh, state machines. And the runtime is the state transition function. So it's what gets processed within the confines of a single block. Um, and from a developer point of view, it's it's composed out of uh, pallets, which are you can think of as the substrate version of a module. Um, yeah, we, we'll go more into these um, a little bit later. So there's also the consensus layer. And this is kind of split into two uh, separate functions. One function is the authoring function, which handles producing new blocks. And the other function is the finality function, which handles making those blocks final. So once a block is final, it can no longer be reverted. Whereas the new blocks that are authored uh, they sometimes can get forked or reverted depending on your chain logic. So with substrate, you have a few uh, options for authoring. You have proof of work, which is what Bitcoin and Ethereum uses. Um, but you also have uh, proof of authority, uh, which is called ARA, and uh, proof of stake, which is called BABE. The new, the new consensus uh, that we're working on is called Sassafras. And then you also have the ability to kind of manually uh, seal blocks. So this just is a blockchain that doesn't produce a block until you tell it to, and then it'll produce the next block. Um, additionally, there's some options for finality. We only have uh, a few of these so far, um, but our finality gadget uh, it's called Grandpa. Um, and then we also have finality that follows the Polkadot uh, relay chain. Um, or, or your blockchain can just implement no finality at all. So um, the substrate node template, which we'll be using uh, in the next workshop, is essentially all all of these layers out of the box. Um, so so now I'll go into more of kind of the tools that are exist in the ecosystem of, of Substrate. Oh, so one of the major features of Substrate is that uh, you can do runtime upgrades. So you can upgrade the logic of the chain um, while that chain is live. So you can think of it as like launching a rocket into space and then doing some modification of that rocket while it's on its way to its destination. So this is something that's completely new that Substrate introduced. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be showing that in the next workshop as well. So essentially what this solves is um, the the uh, hard fork problem. So in blockchains, when there's either a bug that's discovered or you want to add a new feature, usually what you ha have to do is you need to fork that chain, uh, which essentially creates a new history of that chain. So at, at a certain block, you, s you change the nature of that chain entirely. And if certain nodes don't upgrade to the new uh, software, they get left behind. So it's essentially a backwards incompatible change that you make to blockchains. Usually these are highly controversial. Um, so 
people have all people look for a better way. So yeah, essentially what you have is a chain that has the old logic that you split off into a new chain with new logic, but that old chain continues to exist. So if you're familiar with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, uh, what you have is the Ethereum Classic chain that continued to exist while the Ethereum chain forked itself off to, to fix a certain bug. So how substrate changes this is with forkless upgrades. Um, so instead of having two chains that will exist when you introduce new logic, what you're able to do is you're able to continue the same chain while, while adding that logic. So you no longer have the two, the two chains, the, the fork problem. So these runtime upgrades are handled uh, via governance. So Substrate uses um, on-chain governance to handle this. There's a few different options. So you can use what's called the pseudo palette, um, which is essentially a single account that has the ability to make any kind of change that it would like. You also have uh, the democracy palette, which allows the token holders to vote on on new changes. Um, but you also have the ability to completely customize the logic that surrounds this too. So, so if you want something where maybe there's a group of 10 people and these 10 people need to come to a majority agreement to upgrade the chain, you can implement something like that. So it solves the problem that uh, for nodes that don't update, that they continue on the chain. But in the very extreme scenarios, there's always the ability to fork that chain if you need to. So one tool that exists in the Substrate ecosystem is uh, Polkadot.js. So Polkadot.js is kind of a suite of software tools that allow you to interact with your substrate chain. Um, so what you have with Polkadot.js is a TypeScript API. So if you're designing any kind of web application, you'll be able to use, uh, use this API library to do that. Um, but you also have a flexible dashboard, uh, which is called apps. And this supports uh, most substrate chains, uh, such as um, the Rococo, West End testnets, the Kusama mainnet, Polkadot, and more. Um, and it even supports kind of development chains. So we'll be using it to interact with our development chain as well. Um, this is how it looks. So, it's essentially a generalized dashboard for any substrate chain. So it's super cool because what it does is it will read the metadata associated with your chain that gets produced when your chain is compiled. And then it'll give you the customized options for your chain just out of the box. Um, substrate also has smart contracts. So it has what's called the contracts palette. Um, this implements uh, a new virtual machine uh, for smart contracts and a, uh, a new language called ink, which targets this virtual machine. Uh, Substrate also has an EVM palette, which supports Ethereum smart contracts and uh, a new initiative called the Frontier Project which actually allows for complete interoperability with Ethereum code. So the goal of Frontier is to allow any, any project that has written their code to target Ethereum to deploy on the substrate by basically just changing uh, 
changing which chain they, they deploy on. No other change to their code. Um, and then kind of a, another piece of the Substrate ecosystem is called Cumulus. So Cumulus is a, a library that extends Substrate and allows a Substrate built chain to become a Polkadot parachain um, to, to interoperate within the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, and then if you choose to use Substrate, you also have a bunch of other tools that you get with it. So you, you have the Substrate Marketplace, which is kind of like an app store. Um, you have uh, the Sidecar, which gives you a REST API. Um, you, can you can sign offline transactions with a transaction wrapper. You can index your chain with Substrate Archive. You can use uh, the Parity Signer wallet to have to make your phone into a hardware wallet. Um, you get telemetry just out of the box, and then you can use Poke Assembly dashboard to be your governance portal. And Poke Scan can support your chain with a block explorer. So, because Substrate is such a generalized framework. All these tools just work with your chain. When you after you build your chain, these tools, usually with no modification, or maybe depending on the complexity of your chain, very little modification, that they'll just work, which is amazing. Okay, so um, now I'll go into a bit of the basics of runtime development. Um, before I jump into that. Do we have any questions so far? Okay, so let's go into a bit of the basics of runtime de development. Um, so this will prep you for the next session where we actually will build a blockchain. So one of the first things you should remember when you start to uh, build on Substrate is that you need to verify your logic first and commit or write that logic last. So this is because Substrate doesn't revert transactions like other blockchains such as Ethereum does. But when storage is written, that storage will, will, will just get written to the chain. Uh, so if you, if you don't verify all of the logic that will get written to the chain first, you'll end up with a, a, an unintended uh, outcome. Uh, fr from some of your transactions. So um, a skeleton of a module kind of looks like this. Um, you have a few major parts. Um, you have the imports. You have the configuration trait. Um, so this is all written in Rust, by the way. So if um, if you're wondering what the syntax is, it's Rust syntax. Um, so the trait is basically a uh, an interface onto your module, and it defines the custom types. Um, the the next major piece is the storage. So you so we use the Decl storage mo uh, macro. Um, then we have the the module logic. So these are the extrinsics, as they're called, or the transaction types that you define on your chain. So we put those inside of the Decl module macro. Um, then we also have a macro for events, which are uh, kind of logs that your chain emits when certain things happen inside of the runtime logic. Um, and then we have another macro for any kind of error that your chain might encounter. Um, and then we and then for internal logic, so think of kind of private functions. Uh, we put those into the impl module block. So, because Substrate is such a generic framework, 
Um, there's a bit of boilerplate um, that goes into it. Um, but essentially how it works is that you have your configuration trait and this will inherit from usually the system, the substrate system palette. Um, that'll provide you the basic types such as the block number, uh, randomness, the hash, but then you can also extend it by defining your own types. So here, here the event type is defined, um, but you can also extend this by defining, let's say a balance type. So type balance, uh, which handles the balances of accounts. So when your um, trait inherits from system trait, yeah, you, you get the kind of the out of the box types there. So origin is the kind of this, the, where the transaction or originated. So this is usually an external account, but it can also be a separate module. Um, and then block number, hash, and account ID and, and more. When you declare storage, um, you do it inside of the decal storage block, as I mentioned. And uh, essentially what you do is you define a trait called store and you implement that for your module. So when you implement that, uh, what you do is you define your storage values. So here we're defining some value and some map. Uh, you can add getters to that by using the syntax, get define the function some value so that you can call uh, some value on the module and get this value. Um, yeah, that's, there, there's, um, there's other types of storage as well, besides just um, values and mappings. There's something called a double map, uh, which is useful if you, if you want to have a tuple that returns a value. Um, but essentially this is the, the way you define storage. Um, for events, you, you implement this enum called event, and this, this event enum will take each of the different kinds of events that your blockchain can emit. So if your runtime logic has changed the value or stored a value, then it would emit this uh, value stored event. Um, inside of the decal module is where you define your transaction types. So here's the transaction that actually stores the value. The first argument takes the origin, uh, which is, as I mentioned, where this transaction originated from. And then the second argument uh, is, is defined by the developer. So, uh, so you always need to have the origin argument in the front. Um, but besides that, you can put any, any kind of arguments that your function would take. Um, so here we're taking an input and basically storing that, that input into storage and then emitting the value stored event. So this puts together the, the other two, um, the storage and the event slides. Um, so, and then you can also have errors in your um, runtime. So you define that in a similar way as how you define the events. Um, so you you make the, the error enum, and then you just, they're essentially just um, variations of that enum. So they don't even take any kind of type arguments. Inside of the impl uh, module block is where you put the private functions. So these are functions that will, won't be able to be called by transactions. So for example, minting some tokens. Uh, maybe sometimes you want that to be called from an external account, but most of the time that'll be kind of a private function that will, based on some other public logic, mint some tokens. 
Uh, but these uh, these these functions aren't truly private because they can also be called from other modules. Um, so you can have structs with substrate. Um, so when you define your struct, um, you you want to use the uh, the codec, the parity codec, um, to essentially allow that to be compatible with the substrate encoding. Um, so, so to do that, you just import the encode, decode uh, attributes, and then you derive those attributes for your struct, and then you define your struct I, I, in somewhat of a familiar way. Um, the only thing that might be a bit new are these uh, type arguments here. So essentially this just says there's generic types called hash and balance. And the ID field is a generic hash. The price is a generic balance. Uh, but the gen is a concrete type U64. All right, so that's kind of the intro to substrate. Um, any questions? <laughs> okay, so maybe a, maybe a bit heavy to start out with, but hopefully, hopefully the next session we put it all together. Cool. Sounds good. Um, so do we take a break right now or?